Hello viewers and welcome to another entry within the Lord of the Rings the card game progression series. My name is Mitch. And I'm Matthew. And today we evaluate and review the final player card contents of the LOTR LCG core set. Last episode we took a look at our third sphere of influence, Spirit, but Matthew, what are we covering today? Today we're going to talk about our final sphere, Lore. And since I'm a creature of habit, I've turned to my handy dandy core set rulebook to get an idea of what this sphere is all about. And the sphere of Lore emphasizes the potential of a hero's mind. Intellect, wisdom, experience, and specialized knowledge are all under the domain of this sphere. So when I think of intellect or wisdom or experience in terms of gameplay, I think of card draw. And that's one thing that Lore does really, really well. But they also have specialized knowledge. And sometimes that means really knowing how to hit that enemy or how to hit that location or how to heal. And so this sphere is going to do quite a bit of things. But Mitch, what do you think of this sphere? Well, I think lore is radically dissimilar to all the other spheres we've talked about. Tactics was focused on combat. Uh, spirit was all about questing. Leadership did a little bit of both. And lore kind of offers up a lot of other disparate effects that no other sphere really dabbles in for quite some period of time. I think that, that uh, the gameplay representation of intellect in the form of Drawing a lot of cards where you can think of a lot of different uh, possible solutions to whatever the encounter deck throws at you. I feel that's pretty good, but lore does things in a way that a lot of other spheres just don't. Uh, questing conjures up willpower, but dissimilarly, lore shuts off the threat value of locations and enemies. Or instead of boosting attack value, maybe they have effects we'll see later on, like they ignore defense. So in the core set in particular, it seems like outside of card draw and healing, there's no really unifying theme that we see that ties lore together. But it does a whole hell of a lot, as we'll cover in just a moment. And uh, as always, what better way to kind of try to encompass and encapsulate a sphere of influence than with its heroes and allies? So, starting as ever with heroes, let's talk about our first lore hero of the core set. Up first is Barivor. She is a threat cost of 10, 2 a power, 2 attack, 2 defense strength, and 4 hit points. She is a Dunedane and a Ranger, and her action reads... Exhaust Barivor to choose a player. That player draws two cards. Limit once per round. Well, card draw is fantastic. The more card draw you have, the more options you have, and options are always a good thing. Um, the drawback is she kind of has to sit around. So her stats are good. Two willpower is great. Two attack is great. Two defense strength is great. But if you're going to use her for her action, the stats basically mean nothing unless you have some form of action advantage, like maybe Unexpected Courage that we talked about in the last video. So I think she's a good hero, but a little bit on the expensive side when it comes to threat cost. Yeah, I definitely agree. When Whenever I play Barivor, I always want to use her for her ability, but especially in the early game, it seems like players really struggle and flounder and uh, really just need to establish themselves as quickly as possible against whatever encounter cards they're up against, especially with our core set and some of the scenarios of the uh, Shadows of Mirkwood cycle. It's really going to be the beginning of the game where you really have to kind of scramble and try to win. Once you do get a bit of a foothold, it can start to be a little bit downhill. Uh, but really, most of the challenge comes from the first few rounds of a given quest. And Barivor, she does a lot. She offers a decent attacker. She's a very reasonable defender, and she also quests well. But when it comes down to it, you want to include her in a deck because she does have that card draw ability that no other hero can offer. Uh, so she did see a very significant dose of errata, where she now is limit once per round on that ability, so unexpected courage doesn't make her absolutely insane, but 
it's definitely important to keep her threat cost in mind, just because you never want to hit a dangerous threshold like the classic 30 for Journey Along the Anduin, but if you can manage to include her in a deck, and you can find yourself with any option to use her ability, then I strongly recommend that you do do so. We're going to be covering a specific character a little bit later in this video that can basically tell you when and if you are free to use her ability, and sometimes you may hold her back as an attacker or a defender and no enemy comes off the encounter deck and then you're free to target yourself or another player with that card draw ability. And then, I suppose uh, when we talked about leadership, we discussed common cause. So maybe if you or another player just so happens to end up with another hero that's yet to use an action for the round, maybe you can exhaust that character to ready Barivor and then benefit from that card draw, because it's a zero resource card, and it counts as a card that essentially benefits one player in the form of two cards. So her ability is great, and if ever there comes a time when you are able to activate it, even if you don't draw the solid gold you were hoping for, it thins through your deck, and uh, really it's just an incredibly powerful, almost unique ability. Hero number two is Denethor. Eight threat cost, one willpower, one attack strength, three defense strength, and three hit points. He's Gondor, Noble, and Steward. Action. Exhaust Denethor to look at the top card of the encounter deck. You may move that card to the bottom of the deck. This is the highest defense strength of a hero in the core set, and man, is it pretty good. Three defense is enough to stop a lot of enemies. Not all, but, but certainly a lot, and he's oftentimes going to be a defender. But if for whatever reason you don't need to defend with him, well, then you can use his ability. I will say that Denethor is much more powerful in solo gameplay than he is in multiplayer gameplay, because in solo you only reveal one card, all things being equal, during staging, and with his ability you're going to know exactly what you're going to get if you didn't move it to the bottom. In two or three or four players, then you really only know the first card, and then knowing the first card is sort of only marginal. I mean, I guess if it's really nasty, you can try to prepare for it, or get rid of it. Um, but with that said, I don't see a lot of people using for his action unless they didn't defend with him. In general, you're going to defend, and he's a pretty good defender. Yeah, that's kind of the thing, is he's torn between two different roles. It's either defending, because he's clearly statted for that, or using his ability. If you're not facing an enemy, then it's great. Uh, for the next round, you can look at the top card of the deck. If it's something you can handle, you can leave it there. If it's something that's going to otherwise spell certain defeat or disaster or catastrophe for you, then by all means, put it at the bottom of the encounter deck. Even though you're not removing it from the deck, chances are you're probably not going to have to deal with it at all. Especially in a single-player game, it's unlikely that you're going to be cycling through the entire encounter deck. Uh, certainly as the game continues to evolve and progress, encounter decks become smaller and more synergistic. The cards are more likely to combo off of one another, and then you maybe will go through an encounter deck a time or two during a given game. But Dinothor's got a pretty strong ability when you can use it, because when you engage in scrying like that, you'll know uh, if, let's say, the next card coming off the top of the encounter deck is the Necromancer's Reach. You can commit enough characters to the quest to make sure that you don't take any unnecessary damage, yet you still quest for exactly as much value as you want. You can make sure that your 1 HP characters don't end up being killed by that effect. Or, if all you have to deal with is a location or something, then you can send all of your what would otherwise be attacking characters to the quest, even if, like Legolas, is only able to uh, contribute one paltry drop of willpower. I think my major complaint with this character is that even though he's geared toward defense, his HP is so just unimpressively low. Aragorn is two defense, but he's five hit points. The hill troll swings for six without the benefit of any shadow effect, and that's enough to outright kill Denethor outside of four Gondor, boosting up his defense to a very 
impressive four. But uh, just kind of like you said, Matthew, he's kind of sufficiently underwhelming in a multiplayer context that out of all of our lore heroes, I just... He's not my least often played, but he's uh, definitely just extremely rarely seen in any deck that I build. And that leads us to the best of the three heroes, Glorfindel. Threat cost of 12, 3 willpower, 3 attack strength, 1 defense strength, and 5 hit points. Glorfindel is a noble, Noldor, warrior, action, pay run resource from Glorfindel's pool to heal 1 damage on any character. Limit once per round. Well, maybe he's not quite the best. He's certainly the best in terms of stat allotment. Three willpower, three attack, that's fantastic. One defense strength is meh, but five hit points, that's pretty good. Uh, so as far as the stat line, I think he's really quite great. The issue is his ability being quite expensive, and very much like tactics, lore, at least in the early life of the game, is very much strapped for resources. A lot of their cards are quite expensive. And so paying one resource every single turn to heal a damage on every character can really just get out of control as far as the expense. So do I like the healing on demand? Yes. Do I think it could really come in handy in a pinch? Yeah. Sadly, I think this is one of the most unused heroes ever. Um, particularly because we get a version later on in the game that's pretty good. But even before the second version of Hero Glorvindel. This version just wasn't used very much. I think because the ability, again, is just so expensive, even with those phenomenal stats. With that said, what do you think, Mitch? Well, I so often address uh, efficiency, and Glorfindel 3 attack value is great, but at the cost of 12 threat, that's just really asking a lot. In the core set, it just seems of critical importance to keep your threat to start below uh, 30, so 29 or below. But when a single hero is already taking up 12 of that, it's just really difficult to find space for him in a deck, and especially considering without any kind of built-in action advantage, yeah, it's great to attack for three, it's great to quest for three, but Eowyn can quest for between four and eight each round for the threat cost of nine. Gimli costs 11 threat, but he swings for a base of two, and it's possible that he could attack for six. Uh, Legolas attacks for three, and he's threat cost of nine. Glorfindel's got an incredible pool of HP. I love undefended attacks. I love being able to heal away some of that undefended attack damage, so he does afford players a little bit of advantage in that sense, but, I mean, just one defense point is bad. As we're going to be talking about a large number of different healing effects, I just really can't justify pulling one damage token off of any character for the cost of one, when for about three, each and every round, you can pull off two. So, you said that lore cards are expensive, which I agree with, but further, I don't think lore as a sphere, sorry to spoil it for everyone here, is sufficiently powerful that we generally see a large number of lore heroes. So it's expensive cards, and you're not generating a lot of lore resources, and you're probably unlikely to do any resource acceleration of lore outside of the occasional resource donation from Theodred or something like that. So... He's great if you can toss a copy of Unexpected Courage on him. You can maybe save some card slots in your deck, because I don't think healing is often necessary or mandatory within the core set itself. Uh, he strikes me as all right, and uh, really the only other thing I can say to add any redeeming value to Glorfindel is that sometimes, in between revealing a shadow card and dealing combat damage to a character, you could pay one resource, remove one damage token, and prevent uh, either your hero or ally from being killed. But I just don't think he's uh, powerful enough for what he offers, so... As loath as I am to include Denethor in a deck, I cannot think of the last time that I included Glorfindel in a deck. Let's hope the allies are a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> Up first is the unique Hinnemarth Riversong. Cost of one, 
one willpower and one attack strength, zero defense strength, and a measly one hit point. Hennemarth is a sylvan in action. Exhaust Hennemarth River Song to look at the top card of the encounter deck. Well, kind of like Denethor uh, in ability. Great in solo play. When you're only revealing one card, you know exactly what's coming. Outside of solo play, I mean, it's, it's one cost for one willpower, one attack strength, and that's decent. But other than that, kind of just a, a mediocre ally. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. In a single-player game, it is absolutely incredible because you don't need to exhaust Denethor, your defense-dedicated hero, to scry the top of the encounter deck. All of a sudden, you just have this dirt-cheap little ally. He takes a peek, <laughs> and then you know, okay, I don't need Denethor to defend at all. Uh, maybe you see something so nasty that you're encouraged to use Denethor to drop it to the bottom of the encounter deck. Uh, certainly, we do start to see more and more surge cards where maybe you look at the top card of the encounter deck, but it's going to surge, which means whatever the next card in line is, you have no idea. And then it kind of, you know, kills the utility of this character here. But he's a chump blocker, just like you said. He's reasonably efficient, I guess, in that he can quest, he can attack. Uh, I just think that outside of... Like, once we start to stray beyond the core set, and because we're always going to be playing with at least two players, I think knowing the identity of just one encounter card is close to worthless, and because I'm not a primarily solo player, pretty much as quickly as I can replace him with something more useful, then I go ahead and do it. Uh, especially considering he's unique, if nobody's running Eowyn so that he isn't a dead card in hand upon, you know, multiple drawn copies. I don't know. It's just fascinating to me how he's so good solo, and then he gets so stinky as soon as you expand the game to include two or more players. Up next to bat is Erebor Hammersmith. Two cost, one willpower, one attack, one defense strength, and three hit points. He is a dwarf, and he's a craftsman. Response. After you play Erebor Hammersmith, return the topmost attachment in any player's discard pile to his hand. I think even without his ability, he's actually pretty darn good. Uh, one all around. He could quest, he could attack, he could maybe defend in a pinch, not too horrible. A decent pool of hit points, maybe soaking up some direct damage or what have you. But throw in that response is even better. So if you pitched a card to A1 that you need to get back for some reason, if there's an attachment that went away because of a shadow effect or what have you, he can bring it back. I think he's a great card. Yeah, I mean, what's not to like? In the last video, I said that Wandering Took is an upgrade stats-wise from Guard of the Citadel, in that that had an additional defense. Take Wandering Took, replace the ability for something else, and add another hit point, and that's the Erebor Hammersmith. So, the ability isn't crazy in the core set, because it's generally stuff like power from the earth that you're recurring to your hand or someone else's hand, but it does does give you an excuse to pitch cards to Eowyn that you'd have maybe otherwise held on to. Uh, and as we see our card pool expand, there start to be some really, really powerful attachments that you use up, and then you really want to bounce them back to your hands so that you can put them back into play. Uh, you've mentioned time and time again that once we open up our Khazad Doom Deluxe Expansion, dwarves receive a ton of synergy, and simply by merit of having that dwarf trait, uh, really the card could be blank, practically, and it would at least have some redeeming value. So the Erebor Hammersmith is a lot of stats for not a lot of cost, and uh, if you're playing lore, I think this guy is a staple for quite a while to come. That brings us to another unique ally, Cleowine. Cost of two, one willpower, zero attack, zero defense strength, and two hit points. Cleowine is a Rohan minstrel, and his action reads, exhaust Cleowine to choose a player. That player draws one card. Well, as we said with Barevor, drawing cards is good. Having an ally that lets you draw cards is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you're probably not going to be doing much else with this character. <laughs> Two cost is... Like, don't get me wrong, Glaywine is good, but I think it's this perfect storm of corset cards being sufficiently underwhelming, and he's not 
just one resource, that it doesn't exactly feel good to play him. He kind of looks uh, aloof and <laughs> just kind of charmed or drunk or something in the <laughs> card art, which is a little off-putting. But, you know, you're paying a couple of resources for a character and then you're maybe drawing one card. Maybe the card is good, maybe it's not. I think it has a lot to do with I'm generally underwhelmed when I draw another lore card that I'm just not hugely thrilled with Glaywine. I mean, just mathematically speaking and assessing probability, card draw is invaluable, and the longer a game goes on, all the more benefit you end up deriving from this ally, and certainly it can affect any player. So I think it's fine. Depending on the quest, you probably want to wait until after uh, revealing encounter cards during staging to exhaust him to benefit from his ability, but I think he's totally fine. He's probably much better than I'm giving him credit for. Uh, I don't know if he necessarily feeds into our eventual Rohan trait synergy, but He's a totally decent uh, card, and if you plan on really spending a lot of time on any one scenario, uh, then he just gets better and better. Yeah, I'll certainly say that Tactics has next to no card draw. Certainly in the course of there's none. And even for a long time after that, there's very little. But there's lots of cool Tactics cards. And so if you put Glaywon in the deck, I will take that card draw any day of the week. Yeah, so as is only going to become increasingly abundantly clear, uh, I think that lore is definitely very much a supplemental sphere, and it it doesn't exactly stand well on its own, but it can be a, a tremendous boon to uh, yeah. much more versatile decks. Yeah. Um, two allies to go. The next one is Binder of the Iron Hills. This is a two-cost dwarf with zero willpower, one attack, one defense strength, and two hit points and response. After Miner of the Iron Hills enters play, choose and discard one condition attachment from play. This card just seems to get better and better and better and better as the life of the game goes on. So many nasty treacheries turn into condition attachments. And this is one of the very few ways that we have to get rid of them. And for a long time, it's the only way that we have to get rid of them if you weren't able to cancel them with a test of will. So great card that in any lore deck is almost an automatic three of. Yeah, there are certain scenarios where some of the most dangerous encounter cards are these treacheries that transform into condition attachments. Caught in a web is present in Passage Through Mirkwood and Escape from Dal Guldur, and all of a sudden, a hero does not ready during the refresh phase unless you invest two resources into it uh, each and every time, which goes from... You know, your hero's just doing their thing to all of a sudden they're just absolutely debilitated by that effect. And if you didn't have a test of will in hand, you aren't shit out of luck anymore. You've got some means of, you know, freeing your character from the webs. I will say that there's merit in it being a dwarf, as I look forward to saying every time we encounter a dwarf. Uh, but, I mean, with this character, I guess the only other thing which comes immediately to mind is, do note, if you're a newer player to the game, that responses are always optional, and even though we see a great many, like, player cards that are condition attachments, by no means are you forced to discard, you know, like, your unexpected courage when you put out a minor, right. and, uh, you don't have, like, caught in a web or... Uh, watchful eyes or something like that to get rid of yeah we had a viewer comment about traits and they wanted to play dwarves right out of the core set unfortunately it's not possible not even really possible with the, with the first cycle but eventually spheres start to take a sort of backstage presence compared to traits so eventually we'll be talking lots and lots about traits but in general it's combining a bunch of a myriad of races much like fellowship in the early life but yeah, this is a great card, whether he's dwarven or not. It's going to see a lot of play. 
Yeah, and just note that this is another instance of uh, after it enters play. So whether it's played or put into play, uh, you do get the benefit of that ability. So sneak attack and stand and fight are both two uh, perfectly reasonable cards to combo with this, uh, just if you're in desperate need of uh, triggering that effect there. I mentioned expensive lore cards, and our final ally definitely fits the bill. This is Daughter of the Nimrodel, and she costs three. Uh, one willpower strength, zero attack and zero defense strength, and only one measly little hit point. She is Sylvan, and her action reads, Exhaust Daughter of the Nimrodel to heal up to two damage on any one hero. Well, healing is great, and it's free, unlike Glorfindel, minus the three resources you have to pay to get her on the table. Right. But awfully fragile. Um... A little bit later in the life of the game, we're going to get a far superior healing character. And so, for the most part, even when Sylvan Synergy is sort of fleshed out, she's going to remain in your binder. Yeah, uh, obvious downsides here are no attack, no defense. You don't want to use this as a chump blocker. You touched on the giant expense associated with this card, but a repeated effect is fantastic. Uh, just some precautionary points for this card is you can only target heroes, so allies are ineligible for this effect. Um, generally, you probably want to use this after questing so that the Necromancer's Reach or Exhaustion don't destroy it because it counts as an exhausted character whether it was commit to the quest or not and then you want to be a little bit cognizant of what shadow cards you might face so if I'm defending with uh, Aragorn and he's got some damage already on him am I at risk of flipping over the shadow card and it's deal two or three damage to the defending character? Because if that's the case, there's no action window to use this healing. Like if it was an outright attack bonus to the enemy, like we so often see in the core set, there is an opportunity between the steps of attack resolution for you to pull off points of damage. But, like is really common in the first print-on-demand expansion, the Massing at Osgiliath, any sort of direct damage is resolved immediately, and your daughter doesn't have an opportunity to intervene. Uh, so I said before with healing, sometimes if you're just a very smart or conservative or careful or experienced player, you can make do without, uh, but if you've got access to a fair few lore resources, it's hard to say no to uh, some pretty significant uh, forms of insurance. And just uh, as we continue to go through our lore attachments and events, just uh, kind of juggle in your mind all the different healing options that are available to you, and depending on your playstyle and the specific scenario you're going up against, uh, just, you know, pick the one that uh, seems most appropriate. That brings us to our attachments, the first of which is Dark Knowledge. It costs one, and it's a condition attachment, and it has to attach to a hero, and the attached hero gets negative one willpower strength. Response, exhaust Dark Knowledge to look at one shadow card that was just dealt to an enemy attacking you. Well, negative one willpower strength is definitely not good, unless you never planned on questing with that character to begin with. So maybe Denethor, who only has one, but he's a much better defender. And being able to sort of defend with him and then maybe have an idea of what shadow's coming up could be quite helpful. Although, in reality, um, fast forward a couple of adventure packs and cycles and whatnot, there's going to be a card that basically just puts this one in the binder permanently because it's a more effective way of dealing with shadow effects. But in the core set, eh, it's pretty cheap and has a decent effect. Yeah, I've made it no secret that I absolutely love getting away with undefended attacks as often as <laughs> I can, and this increases the probability that uh, I can safely do so. If I've got like a 2, 3, maybe even 4 attack strength enemy engaged with me, if I can exhaust Dark Knowledge, note, not the attached character, but Dark Knowledge itself, to take a peek at the shadow card, if it's something kind of irrelevant, like I gain a 
point of threat, then I can take that undefended attack knowing full well that I'm not going to suffer the loss of a hero. Uh, or if I see with my dark knowledge that it's going to be, if this attack is undefended, deal a point of damage to each character defending player controls or something, then I'm going to be much more likely to say, okay, this is a situation where I cannot get away with taking this attack undefended. Uh, maybe if, let's say I've got Aragorn, who's a two defense, five hit point sentinel character, and you've got Denethor, three defense, three hit points. If there's uh, some enemy attacking for, you know, five, but we're worried about a uh, plus two attack value shadow card, we can ensure that the appropriate defender is selected. So I don't love this card. Uh, I'm much more likely to just run Hasty Stroke in my decks to cancel shadow cards if it just so happens I get a nasty one, but there is something to be said with uh, being able to put this on a hero and then round after round you can continually benefit uh, from this effect. It's just uh, not exactly my personal playstyle. Our next attachment is Protector of Lorien. It is one cost, and it is a title, and it must attach to a hero. Action! Discard a card from your hand to give attached hero plus one defense or plus one willpower strength until the end of the phase. Limit three times per phase. Uh, I like this card quite a lot. Uh, in our Spirit video, I mentioned one of the great uses of Eowyn is that you can ditch extra copies of unique cards that you might have. So again, when deck building and you want to be consistent, you want to see certain cards, you put three of them. But there's a, some cards you might not want to play all three copies or can't, again, because it's unique. So this is yet another way to get rid of some of those unique cards or some other cards that you just might not happen to need at the moment to either boost up defense or willpower. The limit three times per phase isn't super hampering in the sense that you're probably not going to want to dump your whole hand. Um, but I always like to see cards have limits so they're not uh, overly powerful. But what are your thoughts, Mitch? Well, I suppose, first of all, I think the fact that a limit was added to this card is very apt because mm -hmm. it was intentionally to limit just how powerful this was. Originally, uh, pre-Errata, there was no limit. So if you got to the final quest phase, you could discard 15 cards, give a hero plus 15 willpower, and uh, that was probably the quest. It made things pretty easy. It is worth noting that you can play multiple copies of this card to have each card copy have the limit of three so if you had three protectors of lorian on one hero theoretically you could still pitch uh, nine cards which is a very powerful effect i think that this is generally a card i would only include in a deck if i'm running a lot of lore heroes and if you're doing that you're likely to probably have a large volume of card draw so you are probably going to be holding on to some cards that you don't need uh not only can you throw away extra copies of uniques like you mentioned matthew but also if you draw into a ton of healing that you included in your deck just for the sake of consistency once you get maybe one or two healing cards out and active those are all probably redundant so i think you can use this as emergency questing power after staging to make sure you clear an active location or progress to the next phase of the quest as is necessary or it allows you to kind of nicely respond to something unexpectedly high in threat coming off the top of the encounter deck and uh i think we've complained quite a lot about the fact that um denethor has three defense but he's only got three hit points so if you do have to compensate for some nasty attack strength increasing shadow card or if you just need a one-time hardier defender then a uh, protector of Lorien works very nicely so you could do that on Eleanor you could do that on the sentinel defending Aragorn um so this isn't a card for every deck but Nothing but uh, respect for Protector of Lorien. So one thing that would make this card even better would be if every player in the game could trigger the ability. But sadly, the card's controller is the one that triggers this effect. And in this case, the card's controller would not necessarily be the person who played the card, but rather 
the owner of the hero that it's attached to. So for example, if Mitch plays Protector of Lorien on one of my heroes, then I am now the controller of the card and only I could discard cards to boost up defense strength or willpower strength. Um, but with that said, it's still a handy dandy way to play this on, you know, maybe if you're playing two or three or four players, you could spread it around, boost up a bunch of different players, uh, or a bunch of different hero stats. But either way, I think it's a pretty good card. Uh, discard decks become a thing uh, quite a few years away from the core set where you actually want to get things into your discard pile. And so this is one of the ways, other you know, A1 being another, that can help you do so relatively easily. Yeah, I think the only instance of that that we see nowadays is somebody could include a copy of like a tactics card in a lore and spirit deck. And whether it's through Eowyn or Protector of Lorien, if you were to discard a weird sphere ally you could theoretically use stand together to resurrect that hero so you could cheat a leadership or tactics character into play through the use of a card that allows you to discard and uh, that spirit event so it certainly enables some shenanigans here uh, but Matthew what's our next card up next another fairly ex expensive lore card forest snare it's an item and a trap and it costs three resources. It attaches to an enemy engaged with a player, and that attached enemy cannot attack. So we saw the faint card in the tactic sphere, which only gets rid of one attack during the combat phase. This is sort of a perma faint in that it can forever cancel the attacks of an enemy. So you never have to defend against it. You certainly could attack it back, but again, don't have to defend. It is expensive. The enemy does have to be engaged with you, which means you have to at least survive one round of defending. Uh, with that said, trap decks become a thing quite a bit later in the life of the game, and traps are kind of fun. Uh, but this one's expensive, and uh, but with that said, it's still a pretty decent way of dealing with a bunch of big enemies. Yeah, I think it's undeniable that Forest Snare is indeed an expensive card within the lore sphere, but sometimes it's worth every single resource token, like the Hill Troll is not immune to player card effects, it doesn't have the no attachments clause, so as soon as you Forest Snare it, all of a sudden it's not attacking you for 6, and it's not putting you at risk of having to increase your threat value dramatically. Uh, just like I talked about in the last video, with power from the earth, uh, if at some point you're required to discard all or an attachment or attachments you control, then Forest Snare may end up having to be discarded by that kind of effect. But this is, for a long period of time, the closest thing that we get to a, you know, quote, kill spell in LOTR LCG, where this is kind of just a uh, set it and forget it. There are certain quests and scenarios where you have to destroy a given enemy, like in Passage Through Mirkwood, one of the uh, third quest card requirements is to find and defeat Ungoliant spawn. So if you just trap it in a forest snare, you're never actually going to be able to beat the scenario. You are going to have to kill it eventually. Uh, but, you know, there's really not too much bad to say about Forest Snare. Sometimes tactics is sufficiently powerful that you need not rely on this kind of effect, and just like Matthew said, you do have to stomach one attack, but uh, this is pretty damn decent, and really the only other little neat thing about this card is even though the enemy is engaged with you and it's not attacking, it's still going to be dealt a shadow card, and if you happen to run out of encounter cards from the encounter deck during uh, the combat phase, you don't actually replenish it and, you know, shuffle all the discarded cards together to make a new encounter deck until the quest phase. So Forest Snare helps you dodge attacks, it helps you not deal with nasty shadow effects, and sometimes it helps make your combat math easier just because some of your enemies may not be dealt shadow cards if you exhaust the encounter deck. So it's a cool card, it's something you can return to your hand thanks to Erebor Hammersmith, uh, once we start to stray beyond the core set, this isn't a card we see 
used too often, but in its uh, kind of glory days, uh, it ended up being a hell of a card, and eventually it does uh, make a significant resurgence. Yeah, absolutely. Up next is another three-cost attachment, self-preservation. This is a skill, and it attaches to a character. Action, exhaust, self-preservation to heal two points of damage from attached character. So it costs the same as the Daughter of the Nimrodel, except it's repeatable, and it heals uh, equal to damage. But this is a character. You could put it on an ally if you wanted to. Um, and you exhaust the attachment itself, not a character. So I like it. It's a little bit expensive. Um, but repeatable healing, it's kind of hard to say no to that. Yeah, it's just a little bit uh, more inflexible. So you've got to be pretty certain uh, of what character you really want to be receiving consistent healing prior to playing this. But in general, like if things are going well, it's only one of my characters that's taking damage, like it's Aragorn doing his sentinel defending, taking damage, and then self-preservation strips that away. Uh, often enough, I think attachments are going to be more safe from harassment coming off of the encounter deck than our allies. Like, for instance, Daughter of the Nimrodel has just one hit point. It's almost as if a Nazgul were to breathe too hard or something, the daughter would just kind of crumple and wither away. So... I think that self-preservation is a fine card. It's very rare that I do actually put it on an ally. Certainly someone like Bayorn would be an incredible and just perfect target for this effect, but it's not very often I see Bayorn. It's not very often I use him to defend, and just far more often than not, this is just something that I can kind of mindlessly dump onto the dedicated defending character. I think this card might start to disappear once Matthew and I open up our card pool to include more common defense increasing options, but certainly within the core set, I think it's a fine choice. And uh, I think more often than not, I'm probably inclined to pick self-preservation over Daughter of the Nimrodel. Well, that was the last of our lore attachments, which leads us to the events. Up first is Gandalf's Search, and it has a cost of X. Action, look at the top X cards of any player's deck, add one of those to its owner's hand, and return the rest to the top of the deck in any order. Well, it's kind of cool. If you've got a flush of resources, you can look at as many cards as you want, pick one to go to your hand, and the rest in any order. In practice, I don't really see this in use very often. Um, I definitely think it could be powerful. But I'd rather just pay for sort of pure card draw than looking at some and potentially with. But what do you think? Yeah, I think my primary problems with this card is that if we thought that lore was expensive already, this has no ceiling to how many resources you could invest in it. It's entirely possible that you might have Steward of Gondor and or Horn of Gondor on a lore character and you end up at some point in the game having some like giant pile of resources, but... It almost strikes me that in that situation, especially given how many card draw effects there are in lore, that if for whatever reason you've got all those resources and you're not able to spend them, you're probably already winning or doing very well at that point. And if you are investing a, a large number of resources in Gandalf Search, it's still not guaranteed that you're going to be able to find the one card that you're looking for. And if you use Gandalf Search with just one or two resources, then it's very unlikely that you're going to be finding the card that you're looking for. It's nice to rearrange the top X cards of your deck, but if you're drawing two from Barivor and you're drawing one per round, you kind of have to ask yourself, is that rearrangement even that beneficial? So all in all, this just strikes me as an unacceptably inconsistent card with just a cost that I cannot stomach. Uh, I think the number of situations where you're going to be like thankful that you included this in your deck are essentially going to be zero. 
This just strikes me as way too ineffective, way too expensive, and there are so many other cards that I would just rather include. So I've got to say, hands down, ah, maybe my absolute least favorite lore card. Mm. Well, the very next lore event is Radagast Cunning. It costs one, and it's a quest action. Choose an enemy in the staging area until the end of the phase. That enemy does not contribute its threat strength. Well, it's cheap. I like it. Um, an undervalued card perhaps could be seen more often, but it's a way to completely cancel the threat strength of an enemy in the staging area to help you make some more progress. Um, some enemies have really hefty threat strengths. Uh, the Nazgul, uh, for example, in the core set has a threat strength of 5. It's pretty hefty. Uh, but this gets you around it. Uh, I think it's a really good card. Not played as often as the next event we'll talk about, but I still think it's pretty good. Yeah, this uh, this is another one of those scenario-specific cards, and it's one of the cards like Faramir that when I first opened up my core set, God, I guess five years ago now, I really undervalued it at first. For the cost of uh, just one resource, you can essentially add the equivalent of two or three willpower to your combined total that you've sent to the quest. And certainly you can play multiple copies of this. It's just kind of a situation where you have to ask yourself, am I playing against a scenario where I'm likely to get a significant return on investment for this card? Uh, am I going against enemies that have four or five threats? Ever so often, Matthew and I will touch on the existence of nightmare difficulty scenarios where you kind of pull out some of the weaker encounter cards of a given encounter deck and you slot in some incredibly dangerous and daunting uh, replacements. And sometimes the threat values associated with those are so appallingly high or it's so hugely detrimental should you fail to quest successfully that a card like Radagast's Cunning can be uh, extremely valuable. I always whine about, like, oh, I don't want to pay two resources for this ally because it only contributes, you know, one willpower to the quest. But if you're paying one resource for two or three willpower equivalent, even if you're only benefiting from that once, uh, I think that can be just uh, absolutely superb. So certainly pay attention to... Is the quest you're playing, does it have a lot of enemies? Does it have a lot of locations? What exactly is the makeup of the encounter deck? And just like Matthew mentioned the uh, Nazgul of Dal Guldur, which does happen to have five threat strength, if you quest in a very specific way, if you try to take advantage of the way that the mechanics of a given quest function, sometimes you can kind of sneak around values like that. Like the Nazgul, you can add it to the staging area after you quest, and then you can engage with it, and then you need not use up a copy of Radagast's Cunning. So I think this is a, a pretty damn decent card, certainly one that I did personally undervalue, and uh, something that I've definitely uh, developed a newfound appreciation for over time. Yeah, sort of the cousin card to Radagast Cunning is another quest action event, Secret Path. It also costs one. And so this quest action reads, choose a location in the staging area until the end of the phase. That location does not contribute its threat strength. So uh, almost identical, but instead of enemies, it's locations. Um, locations usually have higher threat strengths than enemies, and they're tougher to deal with, unless you travel to them, whereas enemies, you engage them. So, I think a slightly more powerful card than Radagast Cunning, which is why we see it more often, but it's really, really good. I totally agree. We've uh, lamented the phenomenon that is location lock. Now and then, enemies are much easier to deal with in three or four player games than are locations. So not only do locations generally have higher threat values, like Matthew said, but often enough you're going to just have more available targets for this kind of effect. So... Often enough, it's a slightly higher return on investment than is Radagast's Cunning, so 
generally, if I were to do three copies of Secret Paths, I'd probably maybe go two copies of Radagast's Cunning. But again, it's a little bit scenario specific. Uh, just note that there are plenty of three threat locations in the core set, like Gladden Fields, the Necromancer's Pass, and uh, the Brownlands happens to be five. In fact, one of the nightmare versions of our core set scenarios has a ten threat location. Uh, so if, you know, two resources for two willpower is a hell of a bargain, uh, I would say the equivalent of 10 willpower for just one resource is incredible. So I love Secret Paths and, uh, cannot recommend enough that even though it's not the most, uh, alluring effect in the world, uh, incredibly powerful, if not slightly subtle. Yeah, sometimes things that are less flashy end up being better. And I think that's definitely the case. That leads us to Lore of Imladris, a two-cost event with the action. Choose a character, heal all damage from that character. Well, certainly healing a lot of damage is good, uh, particularly if it's glowing, maybe, where you've racked up a bunch of damage and a bunch of resource, but you don't want to keep that damage around. Um, it's a little bit hefty in cost, right? Self-preservation might be better. But in general, if you really need some healing in a pinch, this is a way to accomplish that. Yeah, I think if you're running effects that do boost HP, as the card pool expands, obviously we'll see more and more of those. But if you've got multiple Citadel plates all loaded up on Glowin, if he's maybe taking more damage than you can heal away with a Daughter of the Nimrodel or a Self-Preservation, Lore of Imladris has no cap to how much damage it can remove. So if you've got uh, Glowin or Gimli with a couple of plates on them, and you need to pull off 11 or 12 plates, points of damage, Lore of Imladris can do that with the one-time investment of two resources. This is our second-to-last healing effect that we'll discuss in the core set, and it's certainly a, a rather compelling option. It's another choose-a-character as opposed to hero effect, and uh, if attachments are generally safer than allies, then normally events in your hand are even safer still. So it's a compelling effect. I I don't generally use it too often, but one of our Shadows of Mirkwood scenarios kind of calls for the ability to uh, conjure up some at-will healing of a character. So Lore of Imladris is a cool card. I don't run it too often myself, just because if I have to heal... Normally, it is maybe only a time or two, but I just like having a more reliable and consistent effect. Two cost for one single-time use event, I'm just not a huge fan of. So it's all right, and uh, I'll certainly always keep it in the back of my mind. That leads us to yet another expensive lore event, three costs, and this is Lorien's Wealth. Action, choose a player, that player draws three cards. Well... If it was a stat-boosting card, we'd say three for three is pretty good. And in this sense, I think drawing three cards is pretty good. Uh, Berevor, of course, is free, although she loses all other actions that she could do. Um, again, I think it's a decent card, and I think paying one resource to draw one card is good. In this case, it's three for three. The problem is, as we will say fairly often, as the card pool expands, we get better, cheaper options than what we were given in the core set. But in the context of the core set, I think it's pretty good. I do think it's it's theoretically good. Three for three is totally acceptable. I can target myself. I can target Matthew. I can target anybody with it. Uh, the problem is that generally I don't find myself using more than one lore character, and that's even speaking well beyond the confines of the core set. So if I've just got one hero pulling in one lore resource per round, if I'm trying to save up three, every time I use secret paths, I drop back down to zero, or every time I use Eradagast's Cunning, or if I use Lore of Imladris, then I'm back down to zero. So I do think it's fine. It's just sufficiently expensive that I really can't justify including it in a deck, just because if I'm being honest with myself, I know that I'm just realistically never going to be able to play it. Berevor, just like you said, is so much more efficient, and even if you're not always able to benefit from her effect, you can get almost as much card draw and a resource that you can 
spend on something else. So totally fine card. I just don't think it, uh, it's just not cost effective enough. And that leads us to the very final lore card of the core set. The very inexpensive Bjorn's Hospitality at a whopping five resources. Its action reads, choose a player. Heal all damage on each hero controlled by that player. So kind of similar to Lore of Imladris, that was pay two resources, heal all damage from one character, hero or ally. This heals all the damage on all allies, which in theory sounds fantastic, especially if you've racked up a lot of damage. In practicality, ooh, expensive, and I've just not seen it played very often. Yes. Uh, how many times throughout the course of this video have we whined about the expense associated with these cards? Five is wildly unacceptable. Generally, all of my damage is going to be going on to one dedicated defender. So why pay five for something that Lore of Imladris could do for two? There are a great many scenarios, especially eventually, where we see a lot of damage being distributed among multiple heroes, but by that time, the card pool is sufficiently developed that we get much cheaper, much more efficient, not more powerful, but just way more practical options here, where you don't have to spend... You know, if, if you're playing two lore heroes and you don't have access to any resource acceleration, this is two and a half rounds worth of resources. So I just think it would be incredibly rare that I would have enough resources to fund this effect. I think it would be even more rare that I would actually get like something I could consider a deal from this, because it is fewer resources than three copies of Lore of Imladris, and it's all confined within the same card, but as I've said before, I just frankly don't think healing is that important in the core set, and really even throughout the uh, first adventure pack cycle, so I like that the ceiling of this card effect is insane, like if somehow I had three five hit point heroes, each of them had two copies of Citadel plates, theoretically Bayorn's hospitality could heal an incredible 36 points of damage, uh, but frankly that kind of result is something that a given elf might encounter once in their very very long life, so <laughs> just unfortunately powerful effect, but Almost under no circumstance could I ever suggest anyone include this card in their deck. Yeah, and even if you were running three lore heroes, which would make it, of course, easier to afford, it's still a card that's going to sit in your hand for quite a while until you need to play it. And as you mentioned, certainly as the game progresses, direct damage against player cards becomes much more prevalent, uh, where you're racking up tons of damage. But as you mentioned, there's still better ways to deal with it as the card pool expands. So certainly, undeniably, I think this is a powerful card, but with so many other two and three cost events in lore, uh, two and three cost attachments and allies, the cards are just expensive in this particular sphere. For whatever reason, it's not one you're going to play very often, if at all. Yeah, I think really my closing thought on this card is even in a nightmare scenario where your heroes are all loaded up with damage, maybe it's great that you're going to be able to save them from death, but if you're up against a quest or scenario with absurd amounts of, you know, global damage coming off of the encounter deck or being dealt out by shadow cards or enemies, whatever it happens to be, because this doesn't touch allies, maybe if you end up losing all of your allies, then you're still going to suffer some slow, painful death through hitting the threat cap, or being location locked, or any number of other things. So, ah, uh, it's not even really an effect that I'm tempted at all by, just because I just can't realistically envision myself ever being in the situation where I would consider even like wishing that I had this card. So uh, as much as I try to give at least an optimistic an opinion about each and every player card under the sun as is possible, I just really, really struggle to find anything nice to say about this one. 
you're not that hospitable towards Bayorn's hospitality, in other words. Oh my god. At <laughs> least at least it wasn't more just terrible sarcasm. <laughs> but with that said, Matthew, we've finished our review of the lore sphere, and indeed each of the four spheres of influence included within the corset will cover one additional card in just a moment that doesn't actually belong to any sphere. But in just taking a moment to reflect, what are your overall thoughts on lore? Well, I would say that if I have a reputation within the LTR LCG community, it would be one of a strong dislike of lore. <laughs> and I think, uh, as I've matured and become more self-aware, that I think, by and large, my dislike of lore is very much colored by lore in the core set. And I therefore undervalued lore in the upcoming to-be-release cycles, at least from the core the perspective of this episode. Um, and so from the core set perspective, I think it's, to me, it's probably not even arguable that it's the weakest of the four. Although tactics as a solo player sphere is probably the weakest of the four. But lore does a lot of cool things with a lot of powerful effects, but they're all just too dang expensive. You can't pay for them all. And so, for a long time, I think lore is still one of those spheres where it's got the coolest, trickiest, comboiest effects. They're just expensive to pay for, and they don't really gel. It's not till much later in the game's uh, life cycle that lore really becomes a power to behold. But I've sort of always held this corset, hodgepodge, too expensive, doesn't really do much um, view of lore, and I'm trying to mature again. Uh, beyond that but again with the context of this video and the course that only just not the best sphere yeah i i'll be honest i th i think i can definitely agree it does strike me as the weakest sphere it almost strikes me as like a grab bag of different sort of unrelated disparate effects where there's a little bit of healing there's recursion of attachments and an enemy can't attack and you don't count threat and then there's healing and more healing and still more healing sure. it just seems like lore is very much a helper sphere where right. you're pretty much relying on everybody else to beat the enemies and beat the scenario right. and you're just uh kind of providing a bit of insurance and easing their path along the way i don't find healing terribly necessary in the core set itself and for that reason sometimes it seems like lore isn't really doing anything card draw is great but part of the reason why i'm not so totally sold on like glaywine and other card draw effects like that is because these lore cards are just by themselves just so individually unappealing so i like a splash of lore now and then and against the occasional scenario it's going to be great barivore is always stellar but apart from just a very select few cards uh lore is a bit of a disappointment within the core set it uh, it just seems like tactics is kind of brainless, like, uh, okay, my attack value is higher, so I can kill more enemies. Spirit is, okay, I've got more willpower, I can quest harder, and uh, leadership is a bit of a mix of both, with some action advantage and resource acceleration thrown in. And lore is just kind of struggling to find an identity at this point. Uh, it can do some of what the other spheres can, but it just seems like it's in a more roundabout, less straightforward, and uh, unfortunately, often enough, less effective manner. Yeah, scrying is one of those things where I've honestly never seen anyone play a scrying deck, although perhaps it's more helpful in solo. Um, in general, and I've said this on a Great Company episode, I often viewed lore as a very reactive sphere as opposed to a proactive sphere. Now, listeners have disagreed with me on the Great Company podcast and given me a different way to think about it, but in general, you react to the enemy with the forest snare. You react to the threat in the staging area. Uh, I think scrying could be considered proactive, but it's just not played very often. But again, my opinions may change as the game develops, but I agree. To me, uh, lore is the cleric of D&D &D in the LOTR LCG 
uh, game in that clerics are something I never want to play if I'm playing an RPG or D&D or whatever because they don't do much, but my god, do I want healing as a tactics player when my guys get beat up. So I'm always happy to see lore hit the table. I just, in the early life of the game, don't really want to play it myself. Yeah. Uh, Last thing I can think of to add is just, I find that chump blocking is such an effective strategy that if I have like a one-hit-point Snowborn Scout or Hinamarth River Song die then there's not really anything left to heal. So eventually, uh, again, as our card pool expands, we do start to gravitate more toward, okay, maybe I will consider trying to make this glow-in resource engine functional because, you know, I can boost up his HP more easily. I can ensure that he's not going to be dying quite so easily. It's just that chump blocking and other strategies like that, it's like, why go for the flare and flourish when the less sexy method of play is just so much more effective. Like the last video when we talked about um, Northern Tracker and Lorian Guide, it's, you know, maybe it would be fun to use Lorian Guide every once in a while, but it's just hard to compete with uh, so overwhelmingly effective a card as Northern Tracker. Uh, But... I suppose before we bring today's video to a close, Matthew, we have one more rather powerful card to cover, and uh, why don't you introduce us to the one and only neutral card from the core set? Luckily, we do not have to end on a whimper. And so our final ally is Gandalf. And Gandalf means me. He's a 5-cost ally, 4 willpower, 4 attack, and 4 defense strength, and 4 hit points. At the end of the round, you have to discard Gandalf from play, and his response reads, After Gandalf enters play, choose one. Either draw three cards, deal four damage to one enemy in play, or reduce your threat by five. Ooh, man, I love options. Um, Gandalf solves so many issues for so many decks for such a long time. Tactics, you need some card draw? You got it. Uh, Spirit? Lore, you need to damage an enemy that you can't do otherwise? You got it. Uh, You need to lower your threat in leadership or tactics? You don't have spirit? Now you can. Such a great card that for a very long time remains stable. I'm sad to report that in the current life cycle of the game, uh, I don't think Gandalf uh, is as necessary as he used to be. Uh, Meaning there's other ways to deal with these sorts of things. But in the early couple, first, second, third year of the game, man, is he a staple of almost everything. I honestly can't add much. Like, what does Gandalf not manage to do? He quests incredibly well. He hits like a truck. And, (laughs) you know, when it comes to defending, often enough, it doesn't really matter if he lives or dies. So, 4 HP, 4 defense, whatever. But I can't even begin to count the number of times that I've been playing games of LOTR LCG. And I've been up against such a swarm of enemies that it looks like I'm going to lose the game. Or I I'm barely going to skate by by the very skin of my teeth and then maybe I draw a copy of Gandalf and instead of losing the quest by a significant margin all of a sudden I'm able to put him into play he destroys an enemy because direct damage bypasses defense strength then I don't have to deal with an attack I don't have to deal with a shadow card and I've got this incredible questing character Uh, you said he can provide an invaluable source of damage but even in like a lore or spirit deck you can really really struggle to get enough attack strength so maybe you use him to decrease threat or deal damage or draw cards and then he ends up lending a huge volume of attack strength to a band of characters uh probably the single most powerful combo in all of the core set is sneak attack plus gandalf because who doesn't love, for the cost of one resource, questing for an additional four, attacking for an additional four, blocking an attack, and benefiting from that when enters play uh, response. So he's an absolutely incredible card. I am not thrilled to even think that there may well come a day when he's not a three of auto-include in every deck, but... 
given the fact that he's neutral, that he can show up anywhere, he can shore up uh, pretty much any weakness that your deck may have. So I think it's great that the card pool does eventually have enough options that he's not the crutch that uh, decks need to rely on. But man, oh man, sometimes the difference between getting off a sneak attack Gandalf and not could easily be uh, winning and losing a scenario. So an incredible card that I really can't speak any more positively about. Definitely the most fun card in the core set. Nothing's better than throwing Gandalf off the <laughs> Most definitely. So, Matthew, I suppose uh, thank you so much for joining me to provide an evaluation, analysis, overview, review, and discussion of each and every player and hero card of the entire core set. It's been a hell of a journey, and I look forward to completing, tackling the three uh, core set scenarios in sequence. Hopefully, we'll manage to one-shot all of those, but to all the viewers and listeners out there, thank you so much for joining Matthew and I on the first little mini adventure of what's sure to be a great many more to come over the course of the progression series. But Matthew, before we conclude and I have you plug your podcast as per usual, any additional overall impressions or thoughts that you'd like to share about the core set itself? Well, the nostalgia is strong with this one. Uh, if I look back at my Amazon.com order history, I ordered my very first core set on July 2nd, 2011, with my second core set just three days later on July 5th. I enjoyed it that much. Um, so it's hard for me, I think, to objectively evaluate the core set. I played the crap out of it when I first got it. Um, I just loved it. Um, with that said, with a little maturity, with an expanded card pool, I can certainly see that there are a lot of dud cards that just never really see the light of day after the Shadows of Merkwood cycle, which corresponds with our core set. But on the flip side, so many cards are still staples. Faint, Test of Will, Eowyn, Legolas. So many of the heroes and other cards in this set remain in decks to this very day, and quite frankly, I don't see ever going away. I think the, the, the core set has two major issues. One, the best cards are overpowered and undercosted, and the worst cards are overpowered and overcosted. It's, it was kind of this weird dichotomy between really, really good but too expensive and really, really good and too cheap. And, and so it's one of those things where uh, I really like the core set. Passage of Mirkwood honestly remains to this day one of my favorite quests, I think purely from nostalgia's sake. So all around, I really enjoy the core set experience, even if it's not totally refined. And so many of these cards just bring back a flood of memories to July of 2011 when the game was only a, you know, a couple of months old. But what do you think overall of our core set? Well, I certainly have to agree that uh, I'm certainly speaking from a very biased position. I was a huge fan of this game even prior to its release. I was, you know, following each and every news item that uh, Fantasy Flight Games trickled out for it, each and every preview article, and I could scarcely just contain my excitement. Uh, when April 20th, 2011 finally did roll around, and that was the day that this game was released, I had pre-ordered three core sets wow. waiting for me so I was definitely all in from the start and because I became a really involved member of the LOTR LCG community from really the very beginning or even before the game was released I always approached each new expansion and at first the core set with this air of like relentless optimism uh, where Really, FFG could do no wrong, and almost every card had a lot of redeeming value, and I just saw everything was just wonderful. Uh, now that I can take a step back, I've been gone from the game for two and a half years or so, there certainly is that overpowering sense of nostalgia and fond memories and just love for this game. But a lot of it is like, okay, I can kind of realize that this card, even in the core set, is something that I would never, ever, ever want to include in a deck. I feel like I'm appraising cards like Faramir and Secret Paths much more fairly now that I can respect just what they can do. Uh, and just overall, I just feel like I'm a little bit more objective. So it certainly is a, a fascinating mix of incredibly powerful cards that seem almost irreplaceable, and then just some cards where, you know, maybe FFG was swinging for the fences and they, eh, they 
kind of fall short. But, you know, what's not to like about the core set apart from all the cards that we don't like? Uh, but in restarting the progression series from the very beginning, it was in part because I wanted an opportunity to go back and celebrate uh, just all these cards that, uh, you know, I cannot help but love. Even cards like Bayorn's Hospitality. Uh, I have very fond memories of looking lovingly upon it while it was uh, safely tucked away in my card binder. <laughs> But certainly, dear viewers and listeners, let Matthew and I know in the comments which of these cards are your personal favorites, which do you have the best memories of, which hold up today in our modern card pool, and which were really only excusable to use, uh, you know, back in the core set only context. But Matthew and I always love to hear from each and every one of you in the comments, so be sure to get in touch. But Matthew, let's wrap up this video and let's bring our evaluation of the core set to a close. So why don't you toss out your plug, I'll say my bit, and uh, then we'll move on to some scenario playthroughs. As a co-host on the Grey Company podcast, I certainly hope you will give us a listen. You can find us all over the interwebs. We are on Twitter, we're on Facebook. We have a website, graycompanypodcast.com, that is gray with an E, and we are an in-depth Lord of the Rings LCG podcast focusing on strategy, deck building, and the metagame. So feel free to give us a listen if you have a spare hour or so. Well, I definitely recommend that you do. If at any point you'd like to get in touch with me, I'm the Hive Tyrant on Twitter and on Facebook. And if you ever feel any inclination whatsoever to support the ongoing Lord of the Rings The Card Game Progression series, I'm also the Hive Tyrant on Patreon. And I would be deeply appreciative for anything you'd be willing to uh, contribute. So, as always, thank you so much for watching and listening. And once again, be sure to check back in again again soon for much more living card game content to come.